everyone. It's so good to have you in the house of the Lord today. Once again, if you are new here, we are so glad you are here. Come on, can we give it up one more time for our first time guests? We love visitors. Uh, it's just like your house. You love visitors too. We love visitors too. My name is Elliot, and my wife Tiffany and I have the great privilege. It's a privilege. It really is a privilege to pastor this group of people called Lifeline Church. If you are happy to be in the house of the Lord today, can you hear it? Come on. Let's go. We're very, we love it. We're a very exciting place. Uh, as you can tell already, we love cheering and screaming, and we just love it. Hope you like it too. So let's get started. This, uh, this is part three of a four-part series called How to Live Through a Bad Day. Um, it's exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> we want to help equip you. We want to help show you that, that through Jesus' words, we can learn how to live through a bad day. We can learn how to live through a bad day. But you know what? Today is not a bad day. Today is a great day because we're in the house of the Lord. But there's a great day coming up. Um, the Easter outreach that we're looking forward to is the Saturday before Easter, April 20th. It is going to be just crazy awesome. It's going to be so good. Last year, this is our annual event that we do the day before Easter. We partner with the city of Lodi, Hutchins Street Square, to bring this year 15,000 eggs we're hoping for 1,500 people to come out to this event, and we are just going to, we're going to wash the feet of the city. That's, that's really the goal of this, is we're, we want to do something for the city that just blesses them. I mean, is, is that so bad? Is that so wrong? Can we just want to bless the city just for that, just for the sake? And so what we thought about for this event, I mean, it's, it's the Easter season, y'all. Y'all know what it's like, CEOs, Christmas and Easter only, you know, and maybe someone invited you here today, and you're like, man, I don't know why, but I'm feeling like tugged to be here because there's something about this season. It's built into the culture a little bit. There's something about this season. You will never have a better opportunity to invite your friends and family. And we, we created this series. Uh, we're presenting this series to you for that reason so that you can bring your maybe unchurched, unsaved friends and family member and just get some practical teaching from the word of God. Man, I just want to live through a bad day. Man, can you just help me with that? Yes, we can. And so this season, coming into that, we do this big outreach so that we can help introduce people to Jesus. We can help introduce people to the, the life-giving message of the gospel. And so some of these folks that are going to be at this event, it's a, very, it's a free event, and we're giving away prizes. Because what good is a free event without some free prizes to go with it, right? So today is your last opportunity to kind of get on board with that. You can see at the table back there. Wave at us, Miss Shallon. She's so great. And she's got a table back there. She's got a table back there where it's our opportunity to say, you know what? I'm going to sponsor one of these gifts. You know, because some of these kids that are coming to this event, they were going to get just, like, eggs. Just that's it, eggs for Easter. You know, they're not as well-to-do as some of us might be. We're blessed, you know. And so we're blessed to be a blessing. So if you're blessed here today and you've got a little extra, maybe $20, $30 extra, maybe you can go back there and even $5. dollars they are small gifts too because some of these eggs they're going to find are golden. And then you open them up, you want a prize. You go back to the Lifeline table and you get yourself a, a bike or a board game or something really cool. I mean, just imagine that. If you're a kid going to a free event where the church is putting it on, Lifeline Church, I don't know what that is, but it was fun and I won a game. That's what we want to do. We don't wash the feet of the city and won. Okay, hang on. One lucky family who comes to this event and then comes to church the next day has an opportunity to win $800 to take their family to Disneyland. Man, that is crazy. We just had a, we were having a, a director's meeting and we thought, man, what is something crazy we can do? And I, and I thought, man, maybe we could take, send somebody to Disneyland. I'll just go ask one of my uh, business owner friends, man, we'll just see what happens. And thanks to Air Tech Heating and Air, they said, oh, yeah, we got that. <laughs> we'll get that for you. We'll get that for you so that some family, because why would we do that? Somebody might be thinking, why would you do that? Why, why you got to bribe, you know? Why you got to do something like that to, to try and get people in the doors? I'll tell you why. Because a family going to heaven instead of hell is worth $800. <laughs> well, that's just the way I see it. It's going to be a great day. And then the next day, we're going to be celebrating Easter right here on, on Sunday, Easter Sunday. And I got news for all y'all. It's going to be a one-service blowout. We're not doing two services. We're going one service, 10 a.m. We're going to cut these steps off. We're going to get this stuff out of here. We're going to have rows all the way up to the front, rows all the way to the back, rows all the way to the side, and it's going to be one big happy family again. Come on, somebody. I know some of you are happy about that, too. It's like the dream team is happy about that. They're like, yes, <laughs> sit one, serve one. Well, I'm good with this one service thing right now. 
that's going to be a great day. But you know what? Um, <laughs> it's a great day, the, the Friday before Easter. We, you know what we call it? We call it Good Friday. It's, it's, it's funny, not really funny, haha, but ironic that we would call it Good Friday because it's actually Jesus' worst day on earth. It was his worst day on earth. That was the day where they, he was betrayed by his closest friend, where they tried him at night, which was illegal to do, by the way. Unjustly, he was taken to that cross. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was shamed. We call it Good Friday. But it was his worst day ever. And this series is all about how Jesus lived through his bad day. This, this series is, is from a book originally by Jack Hayford called, you guessed it, how to live through a bad day. And it has been preached by many churches and many pastors, not the least of which is Chris Hodges from Church of the Highland. I encourage you guys to go check that out. This is great. This is great stuff that's going to help our lives. Because um, I don't know about you, but even since we started this series, how many of you have been through some bad days already? Come on, just wave your hand. I mean, if you've been through a bad day, all right, I want to see how, all you that kept your hand, I want to see how you did it. Um, but you know, I got no shortage of bad day stories. I want to tell you a bad day story right quick. So some of you know that you've got a, you've got a pastor with a past. All right, uh, no secret about that. Um, one, of the, one of the elements about this um, is you can tell that I have a, a 14-year-old son here, but I've been married for seven years. You know, hold on, let me get the calculator out. Pastor with a past, got it, nailed it. Um, praise God. So first of all, um, from here, the first illustration that you're getting is don't ever discredit yourself on what God can do with you. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you're facing, no matter what mistakes you've made, don't ever discredit yourself. Because God takes ashes and turns them into beauty all the time. And the fact that I'm even standing right here, I just have to stop <laughs> and, and thank God that he can use me, that he would choose to use me to, to speak a message of hope to you today. And I believe God does have a message of hope, encouragement, and love. He wants to speak into your life. So my bad day started in my past. It started it was my worst day ever, actually. I'm going to share with you today the worst day I ever had. It was a day where I was living in sin. I was a drug addict, alcoholic, and it was my worst day ever, worst day ever. I remember it. I remember it oh, so clearly. I remember what time of day it was. I remember where I was sitting. I remember whose house I was in. I remember what was going on, and I was sitting on the corner of a box spring mattress in, the, in a dirty apartment, and I remember being so miserable that no matter what I smoked, no matter what I snorted, no matter what I drank, I couldn't be happy no matter what. There was nothing Nothing that could, that could fill the void that was inside of me. I was so miserable and depressed, I was ready to be done with life. I was over it. And I had a one-year-old son, but I, there, was, there was nothing. There was nothing. I was so empty and so dead on the inside, there was nothing I could do. And this is what happened. <laughs> I sat down on the edge of that box spring mattress, and I cried out to God. I said, God, if you're real, get me out of this. If you're real get me out of this. I got arrested two days later for the very last time, for the very last time ever. But what looked like a bad day actually turned into a good day, actually turned into a good day. I've got another story for you. This is a little bit later after I got, after I got better, you know, after I got arrested, went to the Salvation Army, got clean and sober, and I was, I was doing life right, y'all. Come on, bad days happen even when you're trying to do the right thing. Can I get an amen on that? I know, I know it happens. So I'm fresh out of rehab, fresh out of drug program. I get two jobs, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to Delta College full-time, and I'm working two part-time jobs, mobbing my mountain bike back and forth to each job. Come on, somebody feels my pain in here. I don't know who. but And so I'm fresh out, you know, and I'm, I, I feel like I'm doing good. I'm on the right track. I'm doing the right thing. And I... Uh, and I get this call, and so I open my flip phone up. Come on, somebody. I had my flip phone going. I was just trying to make ends meet, y'all. Okay, so it's $30 a month on this little Verizon. Bloop, hello. Oh, child support calling. Oh, good. They're probably just wanting to pack, pat me on the back a little bit. This is going to be great. They said, hey, Elliot, so glad you're getting your life back on track. I'm so proud of you. By the way, you owe me $14,000. I'm like, oh, is that right? I'm riding on my knees. I'm starting to get weak. I'm riding that mountain bike like... Something's got to give. I don't know what. The something's got to give. They said, oh, you don't have it? That's all right. We already seized your bank account. Hope you didn't have any plans tonight. Uh, your bank account seized, and that didn't cover it. Come on, did I say I was fresh out of rehab? Come on, I didn't have that kind of money laying around. And they said, don't worry, we got you. Um, you we'll take care of this. You know, we're just going to go ahead and, and deduct about $900 from each paycheck that you get. I'm like, 
man, you ain't getting it. Even that, That's not going to do it either. Man, I about fell off my mountain bike right then and there. I both, boop. Who's had a bad day before? Come on. Has anyone ever got a paycheck with zero dollars and zero cents written on it? You haven't lived until you've been there and done that. All right. There, there may have been some miscommunications on how much I earned at that time. Um, it got cleared up eventually and is straightened up now. But come on. You know, we've all had bad days. We've all had bad days. But this is what, this is what the writer of Hebrews teaches us about Jesus and how he lived through the bad day and how we can learn to live through the bad day too. Listen to this in Hebrews 12. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it. That's the part I love the best. It says, study how he did it. Because Jesus has been through some stuff. It doesn't matter what I've been through. What Jesus went through was like one, two, three. I lost count more than what I've been through. So we can study how he did it. How did Jesus get through it? He never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. The cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. You know, it's, it's ridiculous, really, that we call it Good Friday because it was just the worst Friday. But you know, it's even, it, that's even better for us. Because now we have a Savior. Now we have a God who not only can relate, but is here to help us. He's here to help us get through those bad days. We're going to talk about statement number six. We're going to skip a couple, so you got to get the book. All right? We got a deadline to meet, and we just wanted to, we wanted to give you the ones that were most pertinent right now. So I'm going to give you statement number six found in John 19, verse 30. He says this, it is finished. It is finished. Statement number six says it is finished. He makes this statement, but it, it really wasn't finished. That's the funny part. That's the interesting part. That's the part we can get wisdom from, is that he said it was finished before it was. He had some kind of assurance that we don't always have in the midst of our hard time, an assurance that things are going to turn out all right, an assurance that my God is for me, so who can be against me? He had that assurance, and he's trying to show us. He's showing us through his word that we can have assurance too. So don't miss next week. It's going to be the last one, and it's it's going to be a doozy, so don't miss it. Invite your friends. It's going, to be, it's going to be wonderful for them. But that's the key. Jesus, in his bad day, he had a sense of finality. He had an assurance of what God was doing and would do through his worst day. And here's the lesson. This is the first blank in your notes if you've got them out. Write this in. Lesson number three. Be assured there is a purpose and an end. In your bad day, in your struggle, be assured there is a purpose and an end. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for sending your son to die on a cross for us. Thank you for teaching us through your word how we can live through our worst day. In Jesus' name, amen. Be assured. To get this, clar to get this clarity on this idea, we need to talk to a guy named Job. Not to be mistaken with Job, because when I got saved, I opened my Bible to the book of Job, because that's what I needed. All right, and I flipped over a few books to flip over to the book of Girlfriend. To see, and then I was flipping over to the book of, you know, just forget it. it don't be confused. It's Job. Even though there's not an E at the end, it's Job. The, if anybody had a real bad day as well, it was my man Job, okay? Job had a pretty bad day. In one day, he lost everything. He lost his family. He lost his job. He lost his savings. He lost his pride. He had boils and sores and stuff all over his body. The only thing he got to keep was his wife. And hold on. Hold on a second. It was like the demons were like, hey, you forgot something. And devil was like, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm going to leave her right there. Now, don't read, don't read too much into that. But the only thing she ever even said to him was, why don't you just curse God and die already? That's the only thing she even said. I'm like, man, that's messed up. Bible, like, why do you got to talk like that? But he went, through some, he went through a bad day. Job went through a bad day. And this is what he said. I'm going to try and summarize this as quick as I can. In Job 30, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger book. It's actually the first, uh, it's, it's the oldest book of the Bible. It's not the first book in your Bible, but it's the oldest one because the Bible is not written in chronological order. It's actually categorized by type of writing. And so this is considered like a poetic book because there's a lot of poetic elements to it. But don't let that distract you from, from this main point. In Job 30, kind of right in the middle, Job says this to God. And if you've ever been through a bad day, you might have found yourself saying something like this. 
I cry to you, O God, but you don't answer. I stand before you, but you don't even look. Come on, has anyone ever felt like that besides me? Come on, I'm crying out. I'm like, God, please, would you? I mean, come on, look at your boy. You're, you're messing up. I know what you should be doing right now, and you're not doing it. <laughs> Anybody ever felt that way? And this is exactly the way Job was talking. But listen to the way God answers. In Job 38, 1 through 4. The Lord answered to Job from the whirlwind, mind you. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? All righty then. <laughs> Thanks, Lord. Uh, brace yourself like a man because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Oh, you, you think you know how this works, huh? You want to sit on my throne for a minute? Huh? Is that what you want, Job? You want to you wanna call the shots for a day or two? You know so much. And this is, this is how, ah, this is the habit that we have, though. We have a bad day, and, and we're saying to God, God, I know what you should be doing, but you're not doing it. And, and, and right here, we, we learn a little bit of, I was like, man, you, you think you know. You think you know a thing or two, but I have some things I want to I wanna question you about. And then, and then, Job, and then Job says this in, in chapter 40, verses 3 through 4. Job replied to the Lord. He said, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. Hindsight does that to a person. You know, when I was in my bad day, I, I could have said, God, uh, but I prayed that you would help me, not take me to jail. Like, but that was, but that was my best day. <laughs> that was the la- hindsight, right? I can look back and be like, oh, wait, yeah, God rescued me. Hindsight does that to a person. But when we're in the midst of our bad day, when we're in the midst of our trouble, when we're in the midst of our pain, our temptation is to be like, God, you're messing up. Come on, I, I can see what you should be doing. How come you're not doing it? This is where Job starts to realize what Jesus realized on his bad day and wants to show us. I don't know everything. I've made assumptions about God based on what things look like on the outside. Did you know? This is wild. Christian people hate hearing this because it messes up our theology a lot. But did you know that Jesus on earth had a different will than the Father? I'll prove it to you. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my, I don't want to go through this. Be assured there is a purpose and an end. Jesus knew something, even though he didn't know it, because Jesus emptied himself. When he was on earth, he was just like us, filled with the Holy Spirit, moving in the Holy Spirit. But he had some limitations. Like, that's why we can identify with him. That's why we can identify with him. That's a good thing. And so when we are in that place, just like Jesus, when he said, not my will, because my will is not to go through all the stuff I'm about to go through in the next 24 hours. That's my will. But God, your will be done. And Jesus had assurance and, and is trying to show us through his word, study how he did it. We can have assurance too that our pain, our struggles, our bad days, they have a purpose and an end. Have you ever heard the, the phrase, you can't judge a book by its cover? Yeah, there's some funny ones I looked into. Have you ever read the book, The Never-Ending Story? Spoiler alert. It ends, okay? Have you ever read the book um, To Kill a Mockingbird? And not a mockingbird in sight, man. Have you ever read that book? Watch the movie? It's not about mockingbirds, y'all. And this same principle is true when we're looking at our own circumstances. When we judge based on face value, but what's going on on the inside, we don't always know until we look into his word, until we look into those those uh, spirit-filled writers, those authors that made up our Bible and say, all right, but what's on the inside? What's going on on the inside of my situation? What is this leading to? What is this bad day leading to? What is this trial, this struggle, this problem I'm facing, what is this leading to? What is it producing? Well, if we just look at our situation from the cover, we get a total misreading. And we're looking at a never-ending story over here, man. It's just crazy. So I want to teach you today. Today will be a little bit more teachy than usual. I want to teach you about the attributes of God, or the attributes of God. And it's found in Job. Job talks about all three that I want to mention today, starting in Job 42, verses 1 through 5. He said this. He replied to the Lord, verse 2, I know that you can do anything. You got a paper Bible? Go ahead. Mark it up. That's something you should always remember. Always, always keep on the forefront. I know that you can do anything, and no one can stop you. 
You ask, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I, and I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Here's another one. Things far too wonderful for me to know. If you've got it, underline it, circle it, remember it. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. Now I've seen you with my own eyes. In that, in that passage, in that little chunk of scripture, we, we find three things out about God that we need to remember in our worst days. Number one, God is all-powerful. That's a blank in your notes. Go ahead, write it in. God is all-powerful. Another word, a nice um, theological term for that is omnipotent. He's all-powerful, omnipotent. He can do anything. Nothing is too small or big for him. There's nothing outside of his ability. Colossians 1 says it like this, for nothing, everything, excuse me, absolutely everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. Man, can we just take a second and acknowledge God for how powerful he is and how he can take care of everything, how he can do just anything he wants, and he is always there, ever-present, all-powerful. He can do anything, anything. He's God. He created the universe. What's holding him back? He can do it all. He is all-powerful. But some might think right now, you're thinking, okay, all-powerful, but what about my problems? What about my struggle? How come he's not here? How come he's not doing what I think he should be doing or maybe you ask a question similar to that why is he letting this happen and that's a, that's a tough question well I think we ought to talk about things like that in church <laughs> I think we ought to try to answer things like that in church you didn't come all this way so I could give you a high five you came all this way so you could learn something you didn't know about God and maybe grow from it and so that's what I want to do for you and that it's worse, we are, it's worse when we're in our bad day. It's like my story. I'm doing the right thing. I gave my life to you. How come you're punishing me? Sending child support on me. Sending all those uh, payment garnishes on me. Why are, you do Why are you doing this to me? See, see what happens there? It's a slight shift. But be because he's all powerful, we blame everything, good and bad, on him. And that's, that's what happens. See, attribute number two. God is all knowing. These all play together. God is all-knowing. Omniscient is the word. He's all-knowing, and you and me, we're not. We can't see the end of the story before it ends. We don't know how it's supposed to play out. We don't know what he has in store for us. Hebrews 4, he knows about everyone everywhere. Everything about us is bare and wide open to the all-seeing eyes of our living God. Nothing can be hidden from him. Let me tell you something. You never have to be afraid of your unknown future with an all-knowing God. You don't, need to, you don't need to fear your unknown future and trust that to an all-knowing God. I'd rather have hope in an all-powerful, all-knowing God than certainty in a very limited me. I tell you that. You know, write, write that down and remember that later. I, I'd rather have trust in him, all-knowing, all-powerful, than if it's based on what I know. Man, we're sunk. We're all sunk. I'm telling you that right now. And what I think things should be like. It's like my son. I mean, so I have a younger son. He's only two years old. And he's got an idea of how things should go. You know what I'm saying? He wakes up in the middle of the night and says, it's playtime. Well, I'll tell you what time it is right now. It's time for you to go to bed right now. And he's, it's, it's candy time all day. All day is candy time. I want candy now. I want candy in this hand. I want candy in that hand. I'm like, no, you need carrots is what you need. Man, look at you, little chunker. You need, some, you need some celery or something, man. Come on. He's got an idea of the way things should be. And me, his father, I have a different idea based on a different perspective. Now, you might think the, the, the distance between a 2-year-old and a 34-year-old is a, a wide gap. That's right. I'm 34 years old. Can you believe that? Young, right? But the, the difference between a 34-year-old and God is, that's a much wider gap. So the difference between what a two-year-old knows and what I know was well, nothing compared to what I know between what God knows. He is all-knowing, all-powerful. And so who am I? Like Job, who am I to question him? You know, I'm the created being. He's the creator. Who am I to question him? And besides that, he's all-knowing. He is all-knowing. 
I just think about Job and God there too. I mean, because we get a line by line example of us, <laughs> of Job doing that with God when we do the exact same thing ourselves. But even when things are going bad, even on your worst day, here's his third attribute. God is ever present. He's ever present. Ever pre- he's always with you. Always with you. Not only that, but he's always for you. We're going to talk about this. Hebrews 13, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? What can these bad days do to me? When I know God is with me, I can face what is against me. I'll lead you to your, in your notes there, this title of this next, uh, the, the ending part of this message is Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. Who's heard of um, Fanny Crosby? Anybody? I didn't think so. <laughs> She's an older gal. She died a while ago. Uh, she, wrote, uh, she wrote a little song called um, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Some of you love that. You're like, yes, finally. I'm singing some hymns up in here. Did you know that she died at the age of 95 and she had been blind her whole life? <laughs> Crazy. She was blinded by her doctor at six weeks old when the doctor was trying out some chemicals and stuff to heal her eyes. <laughs> blinded. She was, she, and she wrote that song. I have a blessed assurance in my... Man, she had a bad day or two. I, I don't know this for sure, but, it's, but they say she wrote like 8,000 hymns. I, that's crazy for a blind woman who had kind of a hard life. That's a little wild. But listen to this, 2 Timothy chapter 1. It's kind of the same thing. I am suffering, yet I'm not ashamed. I'm suffering, yet I'm not ashamed because I know whom I believe. And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Listen, the, the application portion, the, the way we're going to finish today and what I want to leave you with are statements. I know it's a little different. I I like to give you really tangible things that you can go and do, but these are things that you can go and say. These are statements that I want you to say to yourself to remember always when you're going through your worst days. These four statements, I I believe they have the power to really save you. If you keep on saying them, if you say them in the midst of your struggle and your trial, I believe they can help you. And the first one is this. I know that God loves me. I know that God loves me. Now, granted, the, these, these statements are for Christians, okay? If you've given your life to Jesus, these statements are all true, which is available to every single person. But this is where if you're visiting today or if you're, if you're not yet a, a believer in Christ or if you're just here listening and just checking it out, you get a pass on this. You don't have to say these things. I don't, I don't need you to do this. I'm not telling you, you you have to do this, but I am inviting you to try this. I'm inviting you to to. See that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good, and he's for you. And so those of you that have given your your life to Jesus and put your faith in him, when you're going through your bad days, say this. I know that God loves me because who else has died for you lately? Anybody? (laughs) Not me. (laughs) I got one. His name's Jesus. Jeremiah wrote the book on complaining. He wrote the book of Jeremiah, but then he wrote another book called Lamentations. To lament means, <laughs> it's like complaining. It's a Bible word for complaining. He wrote the book on complaining, Lamentations. Yet, this I call to mind in Lamentations 3. Even he had to admit, I call this to mind, therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Some of you are like, yes, another one. Got it. Awesome. But see, that's the cool thing about some of these songs we sing and some of the hymns. I mean, they help us remember what's true about God. Now, they, they get lodged in there. We remember the little jingles. I mean, I would encourage some of us, you know, like I said, you know, this is, this is for you believers. If you're just here as a visitor, man, you get a pass on all this. But I would encourage you, those of you who put your faith in Christ, to uh, consider what you're washing yourselves in. Cons- consider what you're listening to over and over again. Is it, is it the truths about God? Or is it the, the, well, you know what else there is out there. These, these things that, that we're putting forth to wash ourselves in the word, to, to remember what he has to say, that gets you through a bad day. 
to remember. I know that God loves me. I know that God loves me. Because there's other songs out there that don't say the same thing, you know, and they're on, they're on the radio all day and it's on repeat. You hear it three times that day and it's not too encouraging. You know what I mean? It's got a good guitar lick, though, to be honest with you. I mean, they can shred on that guitar, but the, but the things that they're saying over and over again to you, they're just not as true as this. I know that God loves me. I know that God loves me. Number two, I know that God wants the best for me. Uh-huh. Now we're getting into territory where even if you've put your faith in Christ, maybe some of you struggle with this one. I know that God wants the best for me. It's harder for some people because we think if we have bad days or bad things happen to us, maybe it's something I did. Maybe I, maybe I messed up, so he's punishing me. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I felt that way. I really have. But, you know, I need to remind myself of scriptures like these I'm about to share with you right now, like Romans 8. If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, and he gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? Does it? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or are destitute or in danger or threatened with death or just having a bad day? Does it mean he doesn't love us? Does it mean he's not for us anymore? Is that what that means, really? No. It says it right. No. Despite all these things, in the face of all those things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. Man, I'm talking, I'm talking post-salvation. You know, I'm saved and doing all the church stuff, and I'm, you know, on the outside looking good. But on the inside sometimes, I, I have the feelings too. I'm like, man, did I do something wrong? <laughs> what is going on here? I'm having a bad day, and I feel like it's all my fault. Don't be deceived. Say it over yourself. Say it over yourself. I know God wants the best for me. I know he wants the best for me. And listen, what you know about God determines your relationship with God. If we got twisted ideas about who God is, then we're going to have a messed up relationship with who he is. If we believe that he's just waiting for us to mess up, that's going to affect our relationship with him. We'll, we'll have more of a, a relationship like we would with an earthly parent than we would a heavenly one. Because that's the way earthly parents act. I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm only human, you know. My son makes a mistake, my first instinct would be like, no, shouldn't have done that. Heavenly Father's different. You know, we talk about how he's our father all the time. But to be honest, you know, we don't have a good context for what that is all the time. Because some of us have fathers that, I shouldn't even be using that term. <laughs> because that does not reflect at all the way God feels about you. He wants the best for you always, always, no matter what. And you think, well, if he wants the best for me, then why, why, pastor, is there suffering in the world? Why? That's a solid question. Fair to ask. How can I say God wants the best for me even in the middle of my bad day? D did I tell you the story about me on the box spring mattress? I was having a bad day. It was suffering, and not all of it was my fault. There were some things that happened to me that I did not deserve. Does that mean God doesn't want the best for me? Or does it mean we live in a fallen world where sin was introduced into this world and we get to reap the benefits of that for the rest of eternity? That God didn't create us to be robots. That he gave us free will and free choice. And our ancestors, Adam and Eve, they made their choice and we get to live with it. And it changed everything. Does that mean he doesn't want the best for us just because bad things happen? I would argue no. But I, I understand if you struggle with that. I really do. I do too sometimes. But the overwhelming evidence says that God loves you and he's for you. And he does want the best for you. When I was sitting on that, when I was sitting on that mattress, when I called out to God and I said, God, Please help me. It was like God was sitting on the edge of his cloud, you know, and he was like waiting for me. He was waiting. He was like the Holy Spirit was over there and the sun was right there. And he said, guys, did you hear that? Did you hear that? He called out to me, go get him. That's God's attitude. He doesn't create your bad day. He uses it. He doesn't create 
your suffering, he brings you through it. He doesn't create, he didn't create the, the, the things that you're going through, but he uses them for the good of those who love him. Those who love him. That, that's what I would submit to you today. God is not putting his thumb on you, putting you through a bad day. No. He's going to use that bad day to bring you into something glorious. That's exactly, I have my testimony for you. Like, you can argue with me about the Bible all day long if you want, but my testimony says this. No, when I, when I cry out to him, he answers me. Even if I have to, you know, sit in jail for 12 months and then sit through rehab for 12 months, I can look back 13 years later and say, my God rescued me. And there was some bad days in there, but he's for me. He is absolutely for me. Some people might call getting arrested a bad day. Years later, I can tell you, no, it was a bad day, but God used the bad day for good because God wants the best for me. Some people might call Jesus getting tortured and hung on a cross a bad day, but three days later, I can tell you, no, he uses a bad day for the good of all humanity. He doesn't create the bad. He uses it and uses it to lift us out. Statement number three, I know that God has a plan for me. I know that these statements can save you, you know. When you're going through your bad day, if you would just say them to yourself, I know that God has a plan for me. In the middle of your bad days, you have to know he is at work in ways you cannot see. The same guy, Jeremiah, he wrote this, inspired by God. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. He, he wants the best for you and has a plan for you. He has a plan for you. Let me tell you, we, we've, got a, we've got a structure and a system here that's designed to help that happen. It's called Growth Track. And guess what? Today um, is Growth Track Sunday. Step one is today. There is no better time to jump in on the Growth Track except for today. Pastor Daniel is going to be leading that class during second service starting right at 1045. And you know what? I, know, I have a plan for you. I have a plan for you. Step one starts today where you get to look at everything that we do and say, you know what, this might be the home for me. And right after that, next week, we'll show you your spiritual gifts, show you your temperament, show your personality so you can make a difference in the life of another person. Because guess what? You'll never know what purpose feels like until you make a difference in the life of another person. Take my word for it. Take my word for it. You can do good things for yourself all day long, but you won't know what purpose feels like until you make a difference in the life of another person. It's selflessness. That's what our worship leader was, was telling us this morning in our little huddle. And it's, it's all about serving others. It's all about serving others. When, when it's about us, it always falls flat. But when we begin to realize what it means to live a life of service and living for others, that's when our life really comes alive. And things start to change. I'm, I'm making a promise. Try it. Make a difference in the life of another person. See that if you don't hunt that again. That is what purpose feels like. And that's what our growth track is made to do. Bring you along in a process. See how God made you so you can make, because we're all a little different. Man, you may not play the guitar. You may not be good on computers, but, you know, everybody knows how to shake a hand and smile. Well, at least some of you do. <laughs> some of you know how to smile, and I'm seeing it right now. Y'all, your faces are beautiful. You're doing a good job. But, you know, we're all made with different gifts and talents and strengths, and we want to draw that out. And we want to help you see that God has a real purpose for your life. And you can use any one of those. You can use them right here in the body of Christ. You can use them right here on Sunday mornings and on the weekends. You can do it to, to make a difference in the life of another person. Here's statement number four, last one. I know that God will bring me through. And th these are tough, you know that? <laughs> these statements are tough to say in the middle of bad days. On days where you feel like you're lost or you lost something that was dear to you. I know that my God will bring me through. I know that God will bring me through. Second Timothy chapter 4. The Lord will rescue me. Will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. God will bring me through. Now I know some people struggle with this. I have. Final story. This one's hard for me to tell. Um, when Tiffany and I first started pastoring, um, we didn't have a whole lot of experience. You know, we, we were just, you know, they grabbed us by the belt loop and the collar and said, hope you do a good job. 
just threw us right in, you know, and, and we were able to do all, all right, but we were thrown into some situations that we were not completely prepared for. My, my first memorial service was for a dear friend, someone who taught me how to lead worship and play guitar, Pastor Larry. It was, you know, if you've been, if you've been at this church a while, you, you know who that is because he's an awesome man of God, dearly loved. But if you don't know him, um, just know that he was, when we started, he was our associate pastor. And he got diagnosed with an illness, and, and you know, we did everything a, a praying church knows how to do, you know. We were praying for him and, and going for it and calling out to God. And I was in there, you know, I'm, I'm barely saved, only a few years, but I'm going, God, bye, and I'm just asking for boldly, coming before the throne of grace, you know what I'm saying? We just did everything. We did everything. But you know, he passed away. Maybe some of you have been through something like that. I want to I, I submit to you today, I, I know that many of us have been through something like that. Many of us have been through things like that. But I, I, I want to bring a new perspective. I want to bring a new perspective. Because you know what? Pastor Larry is sitting in the greatest place ever saying, good word, Pastor. He's doing better than me. He's doing better than me right now. But see, we get so, we get so single focused that, and we, we, we act like Job. And it's just natural. We, we do this. We say, I, I want it to work out this way. And it just needs to work out this way. And we were hurting about it, you know. It needs to work out this way. And we, we were praying for the rescue you know, we were praying for, we weren't praying for him to go to heaven. But you know, di did Pastor Larry get rescued or did he go to heaven? The answer is yes, to both accounts. He was brought into glory and he's doing better than anyone ever right now. And I can tell you confidently he has a plan for us and he has a plan. That just because the way things don't turn out the way we want them does not mean that God doesn't love you, that he's not for you, that he doesn't have a plan for you, he doesn't care about you. Paul said it like this, and this is, this is so true. If you can get this, if you can get this, you're going to get through some of those worst days. He says this, Paul said it like this, to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I live, if I live, because he wrote this, that we just read, 2 Timothy chapter 4, right before he died, right before he died. And he said, if I live, I'm just going to serve Christ. If I die, even better. I've told Tiffany, and I've told many of you, and I'm stating it publicly in a recorded mic. If I die tomorrow, we're having a party. You, I'm, I'm counting on you. I'll be watching. We're having a party. Standing tables, comedian on the front, pictures of people laughing on the walls. If you're crying, you're going to get talked to. Our ushers will We'll talk to you about this. I'm, I'm kind of kidding, kind of not, though. I'm serious about this. Because this scripture to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm good. I made it. Don't take that as evidence that something bad happened, even if I die horribly. Is this hard to listen to right now? This is serious stuff, though. This is stuff that we face in our lives. If I'm afraid to talk to you about it, then what kind of pastor am I? I need to tell you. To live is Christ. We're going to give it all to him. Believers, listen to me. If we live, we're doing good. We're living for him. If we die, we're doing good. Seated in heavenly places. Listen to this. When you give your life to Jesus, when you've, when you've signed on, when you, when you finally decide to take the plunge, when you say, you know what, uh, I'm ready. I'm ready to trust in him. I'm ready to live for him. This is your last blank. My struggles have a purpose. And my pain has an end. My struggle, it has a purpose. And my pain has an end. That's what Jesus teaches us from the place of his worst suffering. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I, I, I want to pray over you. Father, I just know that you're, you're working out something wonderful. You're working out something wonderful in, in this house. And you're, you're bringing us through some of our hardest times so that we can, we can see you for who you are. You're all-powerful. 
you're all knowing. And you're always with us. You're always for us, God. And Lord, even if we struggle to see the final product, which we all do, we struggle to see the finality of what you're trying to bring us into. But Lord, if we would just depend on you, trust in you through our hard times, learn to trust in you, that it would change everything. That's what I pray right now for the people of God and, and anyone listening who would have ears to hear, just, listen, just hear me now. You can trust him. You can trust God. He is for you. His kindness extends to the entire world. He, he responded to me when I didn't even believe in him. So I'd invite you to do the same. If you're in a place where you, you haven't yet made that decision, you don't need to feel awkward or embarrassed. That's exactly my same story. I want to pray that every heart would be open. I want to pray for anyone who is ready to say, God, I want to give you my life. I want to trust in Jesus. I want to, I want to turn from my own way. I've tried my own way. It didn't work. I want to try living for Jesus. I want to give my life to Jesus and give the controls of my life to him. And if you are here and that's you, I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a moment. But also, if you used to live that way, but, but you've drifted, you know, that, that's a, that's a, that happens too. We're not as close to him as we know we should be or we know we could be or maybe something actually happened that, that drove that relationship apart. I want to give you an opportunity to start fresh. Our God is a God of second chances. So if I described you in any way, shape, or form, if you want to give your life to God today, I say, I, I believe Jesus is the Son of God and that he died for me on that cross. If you want me to include you in this prayer to follow, I just want you to lift your hand. One, two, three. Come on, lift it up to the sky and say, God, that's me. Amen, I see your hand. Amen, I see your hand. Amen, I see your hand. Hallelujah. Amen, I see you. Amen, I see you. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's, church, let's pray this prayer together for the sake of everyone giving their life to the Lord today. Come on, church, if you believe this, say this with me. Father God, I give my life to you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who lived through such a bad day to give me this day. I repent of my sins. I come to you. Fill me with your spirit and lead me in the way I should go. In Jesus' name, amen.